Hey there YouTubers. This one's going to be a little bit mathy. I'll show you where I'm headed. I've been talking about what is a polymath on YouTube. I'm not directly subs I have subscribed to to these but I'm not um participating in the discussions exactly. But um CJ is that's um Philadelphia's Buckminster Fuller guy. There's a lot of connection and overlap with these groups, I feel, and I'm pleased about that. In general, getting connected is what the Internet's all about, and I have a friend, say, in Holland, who's helping me with my studies of the world's fairs. So if we look at history again, I'm taking in more about the Spokane World's Fair I didn't get to that personally, right? That was in 74. I would have been in the Philippines going to high school. And also more about the New York World's Fair of 1964. That one we've been talking about on this channel. For those just joining, I do a lot about um, Buckminster Fuller here, and then I branch off into all kinds of different topics lately very historically oriented focusing on movie makers and movie making because I'm into as kind of a a son of a city planner someone who was blown away by the Oregon Country Fair how well that was pulled off and you know I've been to my share of outdoor rock concerts I've never been to Burning Man but I'm thinking what would um, 24-7, 365 Burning Man look like? <clears throat> Obviously, it would be a disaster in that form, but <clears throat> how do we blend the things that we've learned over the years and create something new that's very affordable, i.e. free to just go there, really? And then there's all kinds of housing solutions being prototyped, kind of like Woodstock meets Epcot. All right, so where I'm headed in the mathy part is this contention over on the right lower corner. Let me go into present mode and see if it stays on this slide. This is from a slideshow I've gone through a few times here in this channel. And if you look back in my channel, if you know how to pull up a specific channel, C slash Kirby Earner, and go back a bit, you'll see... Um, Relative to this video, a few not so many ago, I was talking through these slides once again, the slide deck. Because it's kind of a formal introduction to the math part of <coughs> synergetics, which is focused on a hierarchy of polyhedra. Now, there is another synergetics out there published at a similar time. Same title. And there's a lot more, like scholarly and academic writing floating around that. There's more of a buzz, maybe, around that synergetics than this one. So you may be um, confused about the two, but Wikipedia does a good job disambiguating. So we're saying here that any four CCP ball centers that define a tetrahedron define a whole number volume as the regular four ball tetrahedron versus, excuse me, actually vis-a-vis, -vis, it should really be read as, vis-a-vis -vis the regular four-ball tetrahedron of volume one. I'm going to leave this slide here, remember the, the quad rays, and show you an empirical approach, not a proof. A proof wouldn't be that hard, and in fact, Bob Gray has done that, and actually there's a more general version of it. Um, but you can just take any tetrahedron and prove to yourself that moving any four corners, any of the four corners, by a hop is going to keep a whole number volume. And then by, by induction, it's always going to be a whole number volume. So you start with the regular tetrahedron, like the one here on the left. We call this volume one. Now we do also think of these internal basis vectors, we'll call them, as you can uh, linear combinations of these, uh, just like in XYZ, will point to any point in space. So any point in space can be expressed as a vector sum of these guys. And by vector sum, I mean you also get to stretch them. 
you don't get to reverse them necessarily. That's why we consider all four at the same um, existential level, you could say. Because once you're pointing backwards, you've induced rotation. Without inducing rotation, four spokes from a center provides a first symmetry, that of the simplex. And we're exploiting that. And, okay, so in our, in our demo here, we're going to do uh, a tetra volume computation. Scrolling back, there it is, more or less. This is internal to a, um, a Python class, the tetrahedron class. Every tetrahedron knows how to compute its own volume. Now let's go out of presentation mode and look at a couple other things. First of all, in Jupyter Lab, which has been a frequent uh, modality on this channel, I'm scrolling back through again what's the cubic closed packing and how when you connect neighboring spheres to one another, you get what? The IVM. Now I think it was good design actually on Fuller's part. Even though isotropic vector matrix is a long thing and a mouthful, when you shorten it to IVM, it's just three letters all capitalized, and that, you could say, rhymes with, fits right into the same paradigm as XYZ, meaning the three dimensions, right? X, Y, and Z, mutually perpendicular, right? Now that's in contrast to quadrays, you could say, or in contrast to what we were just looking at with the four basis vectors. Now we have six, uh, except only three of them are considered basis vectors, and the other three are secondary or non-basis or non-primary. So that's a different sort of cast system or something. So here is that same computation. Again, it's in Python, but you can do it in multiple languages. And what we're saying is, if you randomly do a random walk from the origin, 0, 0, 0, 0, or in XYZ, 0, 0, 0, and jump to the neighboring spheres in the 12 around 1 picture. So here's one of your balls. And through each of its rhombic dodecahedron diamond faces, through each of those 12 faces right through the center, is going to be another ball touching it, kissing it, right there at that point. So you picture 12 balls surrounding that one. And like in a chessboard, which constrains your motions, you're only allowed in this game to jump from one ball center to a neighboring ball center. That's all you can do. And we call it a random walk when you do that. And you do it over and over. In other words, you can get further and further away from the origin as you go. And so that's where here we are back in Spider, the editor. And let's go to the console where we're actually talking to Python. I ran some unit tests. I haven't pulled this up for a while and just notice the import syntax you're allowed to use where you can pull specific things out of a library. In other words here we're pulling out permutations. It's all we're going to need. Or you can rename the whole library. Just give it a shorter name. That's done very often. Import NumPy as NP. Import Pandas as PD. Lots of that kind of stuff goes on. And then here from QRays, which is another, it's in the path. It's another module in the path. Um, we're going to pull out from QRays something called Q vector, which, as you might guess, is one of those quadrays that I was just pointing to in um, the other. See, here's the isotropic vector matrix in architecture. It was patented as the octet truss for a long time. It's a space frame. There are lots of space frames. There it is, <clears throat> once again, in architecture. This is the PSU accelerator building. So like I'm saying, you're going to randomly walk from an arbitrarily chosen center. And you're, there's the 12 balls around one again. And you're going to create an, an arbitrary random tetrahedron by doing that four times. So we're going to get the permutations of 0, 1, 1, 2. Now what that means is, go back to the quadrays again. So let's see, quadrays here. Let's go back into presentation mode. Think of picking paint from a paint palette, like an oil paint. 
like you're dabbing your brush and a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a lot of this, and not so much of this, or whatever you're doing, right? <clears throat> That's kind of what you're doing here. When we say linear combination, what does that even mean? It means you take so much of each vector, which means you can extend it. If you take double of one of them, that's like that puts you way out, you know, in space. But then you need to modify that. You need a little bit of the up pointing one in this orientation and a little bit of this other one. Now all quadrants um, you know, don't use the opposite pointing vector. So if you're in quad this first quadrant or whichever one you want to call it, first quadrant. You're not going to need any of the paint pointing opposite, right? You're just going to want three paints. So there's always going to be a zero in there. And then you want, in relative proportions, one, one, two. Basically, just jumping to the next neighboring sphere. Let's keep it simple. Let's not do proportions, actually. Forget that. Just in hopping to any of the permutations, you're going to go to the one of the 12 neighbors by permutation. So there's 0112, but there's 1012, there's 2110, there's 2101, right? There's actually 12 permutations. You don't count, you know, these two different or you don't count these ones as like when you reverse them, you know, I've seen the word, how you misspelled school. You put <clears throat> one of the O's in front of the other or something like you pretend like the O's have an order in the word school. They don't. These ones um, aren't treated as separately, so you can't just reverse them and say, okay, that's another permutation. But that's how the permutation algorithm treats them. So I, go, I get more than 12 if I just feed it to permutations. I get duplicates. From my point of view, what I'd call duplicates. But by running all of them through set, I manage to get just these. <clears throat> these are the 12 permutations that you should just think of each one as like a frog hopping to a neighboring lily, except you're in volume, so you're going from, say, the origin, the center, a center ball, to one of the 12 neighbor balls, right? So we're going to do that randomly, and we're going to do it <clears throat> like a thousand times. So that's what this little program is, and I, I wrote these interactively at first. These are already written earlier and they're just typed directly into the interactive console and here it says okay start at the origin start at the very center of some space and then a thousand times randomly pick one of those 12 spokes these are the 12 spokes to the 12 neighbors surrounding a sphere the nuclear sphere the one that you're at you're going to jump in one of these 12 directions do it randomly a thousand times, please, and return your location. So I get A, B, C, D, four vertices that way. And then you can see how a random walk from the origin times four would, every time, it would give you basically a different random tetrahedron. And then what we're going to do from those four points is just get the links between them. And if I want to know the links between A and B, I can just go A minus B which is like the vector connecting them, except that's what we would call an edge. If its tail is other than the origin, we call it an edge. But in terms of length, we've got it. We've got the length just by doing A minus B and say dot length, and that's a method inside the Python program, which, like, let's look again. That would be actually inside of QRays. See here, I've defined a vector type object, which just means like a pointy arrow. And I have both the conventional x, y, z vector and in the same uh, module. And you can do this in other languages. Again, um, I've studied some at the uh, Wikipedia site. There's a link to the C++ implementation, which is not by me. I'm not a super C++ person. But Tom is, Tom Ace. And further down, this Q vector is what we're using here. It's just a re-implementation of the vector concept vis-a-vis -vis these four basis vectors. And also, there's a different sense of what we want to be unit, not necessarily the basis vectors, but the edges of that tetrahedron. 
So just to finish up, I <clears throat> create a tetrahedron with those four random six lengths that we just now grabbed, right? Or created, generated. Okay, and why I put the star in front in Python, what that means is this particular initializer dunder in it for the tetrahedron, this intake right here. When you're giving birth to a tetrahedron, you're automatically triggering the underline in it or dunder in it when you do as I did, when you call tetrahedron, which I'm doing um, further down. When I call tetrahedron, I'm triggering dunder in it, and it expects six separate links, six objects, right? But unfortunately, or not unfortunately at all, but um, what would be a problem without the star is that our six links are already bundled up inside of a tuple. They're already a collection inside of a data structure. And we need to separate those out. And if we did it with like subscripting or something, when we passed the arguments, that would be a lot of typing, a lot of characters. But what we can do in uh, Python is put a star in front of a tuple, and that breaks it out, the data structure. It's kind of like, uh, um, in viral terms, like the internal vi viri, uh, the viruses just escape their, their cell container or something like that. Since we're all living through, like, all this pandemic stuff, we should have all boned up on how the virus morphology works. And, of course, there is overlap with synergetics, the icosahedral numbers and so on. It's just important here to distinguish between the nucleocapsid and the fatty membrane, which can be also, you know, possibly has some icosahedral symmetry, but it was really sharp in the nucleus. And like this novel coronavirus, the SARS-2, it's not um, one of those that has a hard in the sense of icosahedral um, nucleus. It doesn't have an icosahedral casing at the nucleus level. It, or by nucleus, I mean the internal RNA strand, and it's, it's surrounded by a helix. It's helical, from the, from the reading I've done, right? Okay? Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. So I create this tetrahedron with these randomly generated lengths, and here's the punchline it comes out a whole number volume, 450. And I started doing this over and over, just running the same code over and over, and yeah, sometimes it gets to be 0.99999. And that just shows what? That the internal floating point has its limits when it comes to accuracy, even by the time you get to these lengths and you've done these square roots or second roots, if you don't want to imagine squares there, uh, you're still going to get you know, floating point is floating point. It only has so much internal bits, like 64 for everything. Now, what if you wanted a different type of number, also operated overloaded, that was arbitrar arbitrary in how many bits you got to use? And it's with these extra tools, like Gimpy 2, that you can push Python to be more like Mathematica, which emulates, right, emulates... Um, what do I mean? Mathematica emulates our idea of real numbers to some degree. In other words, you can specify much higher precision than a wimpy floating point, like 100 bits in this case. So what I do is I run through the whole thing again, but this time, let's see, in Rantet, I go out, I'm basically cutting and pasting what you just saw at the console now into a permanent program that I can keep and share. I'll put it in my Python 5 subfolder up in GitHub, right? The Python 5 repo at the 4D solutions, so you can grab this if you feel like it. And all it does is print volume at the ends, but it's also using Gimpy to start off, in other words, I go to 500 places of precision, and uh, when I initialize my first origin Q vector, like the, the, the zero vector at the origin, I feed it four gimpy zeros, not just plain old zero, but a zero to 500 bits of precision. 
And we basically are in a, a closure situ situation where we don't break out of the multi-precision anywhere in the computations. In other words, in calling length, we don't break character, you could say. And in calling tetrahedron's volume method, everything stays high precision to however many bits we've specified. And we run through those calculations again. I don't rewrite them or anything. Um, I'm using the, pretty much the same code as before. But there's, this is agnostic as to type. If you know about Python with its dynamic typing, you don't have to tell the compiler that, oh, by the way, these might not be floating point numbers. They might be GIMPy2 numbers of 500 bits precision or whatever. Python doesn't need to know that at compile time. That's what makes it slower to run, faster to write. So let's run it. Here I am at the console, and uh, I decided to boost up the precision to like 200 bits. So first I'm printing out the six edges I get randomly, and then I feed them into the volume formula. Remember this is tetra volumes. Unit volume tetrahedron, four CCP balls, define six edges, define volume one. And you can put our quad rays in, inside of that. And so obviously they're A module edges and they don't have unit length, but the edges of the tetrahedron are what matter, and that's going to be our unit of volume. And notice sometimes I'm so on the nail that it just says 0 0.0. It's like Gimpy is, numbers are comfortable with that when they don't see anything, any reason not to put point zero. But here, okay, there's a point, there's a 102 way out here at 200 at the very end. So it lets me know, but you can see how we're very, very precise here. When we say whole number volume for random CCP tetrahedron, we're not kidding, right? Or you might get a situation like this. And you're saying, okay, that's 200 bits of accuracy. What about like 500 or something. If I ever do that, you could see I was like playing around here. Always the answer is a whole number, right? With a little bit of noise. So yeah, I was just starting to do 500 bits of precision before starting this video. So what would you do if you wanted to boost precision even higher, right? You do that in the editor, in the RANDs, tet program scroll up and there's going to be limits here like if you're new to programming immediately you're going to think well I'll just like put this this much precision and it's going to work no there's limits right but let's do a thousand just for kicks and okay I can just save this now and go back to well, I can run it let's go to the, the normal view here Window layouts, we would normally just want the default layout, I'll call it. Actually, there's there's some some things I do to change that. Oh, let's hope it doesn't change all my fonts and everything, too, or font sizes. But that's life in an IDE, right? So now we're finally, like, you might be using a different IDE than Spider. If you go back in this channel, it's like, I'm kind of bringing kids up through Codesters, and then we switch to Spider. I have had a um, pretty good experience with Codesters for introduction to Python, codesters.com. Okay, and I, that doesn't have like this Gimpy2 stuff or whatever. So I just hit the green arrow now, and it's going to be generating those random tetrahedrons. I've suppressed printing out the lengths. So we're just getting out the volumes to 1,000 bits now. Not 1,000 digits, but bits. Now the decimal type, which is internal to the Python library, is another solution. If you want high precision, arbitrary precision, floating point, not floating point, uh, decimal numbers, right? It's different from big integers. This is like to the right of the decimal is how you're going precise. Whereas there is another number type that keeps you in the integers, but is arbitrary in terms of size. On those like prime numbers of a few thousand digits, that's cryptography, right? 
that's going to be used the big integer. This is a different type of number from big integer. But because Python is so type agnostic, if you write it that way, I'm able to use the same code that I used originally today. I showed you floating point version, and then I just slipped in to GIMP2 without much change at all to the code. I won't say it's always that easy. But if you're using like C++, you know, you have to get into, or Rust or whatever, uh, you have to be more explicit about the different types that are going to be expected coming to be coming through, and therefore the code that gets uh, generated for runtime is far less, right? Rust has just a tiny runtime, whereas Python is a pretty big thing to have there in, in your memory while you're running a Python program. You could say a lot of my YouTubes, they have a runtime in the sense that if you've taken in a lot of what's in my YouTubes, then you'll get maybe more out of all of them, each one, because you understand more about how the puzzle pieces fit. But I don't want to discourage you if you've just joined us. If you found this intriguing, continue to watch the YouTubes. And um, you'll see that they, they go along a theme for a while. They veer around a lot, but they connect around like a ball, right? Kind of like, like this. Right? This is C60, and you'll see that in my other videos as well. It, it's a lattice that's in the CCP form and therefore is a hands-on uh, introduction to these concepts. And I find that, you know, for all of this looking at pictures, it really helps to get manually familiar, like put it in your muscle memory, some of these things. So the hands-on component, that's not as easy to implement as over the wire, like we're doing here with these YouTubes, but it is a component, and it's something I encourage you to work on it on your side, right? Whether you're building tensegrity furniture, which is big on YouTube right now, it's often called impossible or anti-gravity. Those are kind of hype terms. Or you just feel like not many people have actual C60. There's me with kids and using it in the past, right? Not during this time. And the quad rays and all this. So the, the stuff I'm scrolling through here is available free online in terms of Jupyter Notebooks. So this is actually just a local host version of what's out there in my repo. So there's no um, nothing that you have to pay for here to sort of get up to speed and then start asking why is this whole number volume stuff so not in the textbooks, right? Because that's going to be a nice sociological question. We've taken it up on this channel already, some, but you may want to do your own analysis on that and figure it out for yourself. All right. Good chatting with you. Stay tuned and enjoy your weekend.